All right, good morning. Um, apologize for all the technical issues, but we're glad that you can join us. <clears throat> for everyone in the church at home, we're glad you're with us as well. Uh, we're going to continue, you know, it's the week before Easter. We've been studying through Mark's Gospel. And this morning I'm going to take us through chapters 14 and 15. And I'm going to kind of move through it like I've done the last couple of weeks so that the things that I really want to, that I feel impressed to present to you, I want to make sure you see them in the context of what's happening. And so I'm going to be moving through chapters 14 and 15 fairly quickly. We won't be actually reading text. Okay? <clears throat> so if, if you haven't gotten your communion elements, we're not going to pause for it very long. So I want you to get those. <clears throat> the title of my message this morning is The Beginning of the End. Mark chapter 14 begins with the woman. It's a famous text where the woman comes to Jesus and she breaks open a, a jar of perfume, ex very expensive perfume, and anoints Jesus. And some of, the, you know, some of the men in the room complained that it was a waste of money. They could have fed the poor. And Jesus says, hey, she's anointed me for my burial. <clears throat> they move from there, verses 12 through 26, again, Mark chapter 14. And Jesus gives the disciples instructions for observing the Passover. This is why Jesus was in a hurry. Those of you who have been following our Mark teachings know that from the time He appeared at, the, at Mount Hermon and had what we call the Mount of Transfiguration, He's been in a hurry to get to Jerusalem, and this is why. He wants to be there for the Passover. It's one of the high festivals in the Jewish religion, and He wants to be there. And you remember, I've talked about, He's the new sheriff in town. And he's, he's, he's headed to Jerusalem for a showdown with the religious leaders of the day. This morning's message is all about that. Uh, and then I'll, I'll get into it, obviously. So he instructs them that they're going to share the Passover together. Verses 22 through 25 is what we call either Eucharist in the high church, communion is what I grew up having it called, the Lord's Supper, some people call it, and some of you probably have been have heard it referred to in church as we're going to celebrate the Last Supper. Is that right? Some of you have heard that, right? <clears throat> we're going to call it the Last Supper, and I'll tell you why. Jesus is sitting around the table there. He has probably done this twice before with the apostles. They're celebrating at this time, and Jesus tells them, while they're sitting around the table, He says, one of you is going to betray me. And the disciples are shocked by that. And they're looking around and they're arguing about who's going to betray you. And they ask Jesus, who's going to betray you? And he gives a very cryptic answer. He doesn't tell them who's going to betray them. Who's going to betray him. Now, we know it was Judas. We have the benefit of hindsight. We know the whole story. But just picture yourself with the apostles sitting with Jesus, doing the Passover meal. He's given them the feeling that I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to set things right. Right? That's, that was his attitude when he left Mount Hermon. When he gets to Jerusalem, what's one of the first things he does? Uh, Leo shared a couple of weeks ago. He goes into the temple with a whip and starts turning over the tables. Very confrontational, right? And then what does he do? He goes back the next day and confronts the scribes and Pharisees, the religious leaders. So his followers are sitting at this Passover meal when he says, so one of you is going to betray me. And their, their head is probably spinning. He's been, it seems like Jesus is giving them conflicting messages. He's been telling them, I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles. I will be crucified, but I will rise in three days. But then on the other hand, he's going into the temple and having face-to-face -face confrontation with the Pharisees. And the disciples are probably sitting there going, what is he talking about? He hasn't been arrested yet. Why would they arrest him now? I mean, they would have arrested him while he's in the temple turning over the tables. But we know... We know that he's about to be arrested. He's about to be handed over to the Romans. He's about to be tortured and executed. And he's about to die. 
And in the midst of all this, he tells them, this is the last time that I'm going to partake of this meal with you. This is the last time I'm going to eat or drink from the fruit of the vine until I come into my kingdom. And so the mood in the room has changed. They're all probably trying to figure out, do you, do you guys follow me that the disciples' heads are spinning and they're trying to figure out what is going on? So, what we're, so for us, we're going to observe the Last Supper together right now. So if you haven't gotten your elements, feel free to go back and get them on the table. Some of you remember in weeks past, I've talked about how when we do the Apostles' Creed, it's like taking the Pledge of Allegiance. I, as I was reading this text and, and trying to wrap my head around it, I had so many questions in my mind, and one of them was that Jesus, it, to me, appears to be telling the disciples, well, he's already told them someone's going to betray me, and then he says, this is the last meal I'm going to have with you. Take and eat this. This is my body broken for you. Take and drink this. This is my blood shed for you. And in doing so, think about this now in the context. Each disciple is thinking, well, he just said one of us is going to betray him. And he doesn't say who it is. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking of me sitting in that table, and I'm, and I'm getting these elements from him, and I'm thinking, well, it's, it's not going to be me. I'm not going to betray him. And so as we take the elements, I'm, in my mind, I'm seeing this as like taking the creed. It's a pledge of allegiance. And when you take these elements this morning, I want you to think this way. After they're done, they go to the Mount of Olives. You remember, we think he's staying with someone on the Mount of Olives. He keeps going back and forth. And it's just a, a very short walk from the Mount of Olives to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And when they get to the Mount of Olives, Jesus tells the disciples, all of you will fall away. And that's when Peter speaks up in verse 29 and says, even if everyone else falls away, I will not. And then Peter looks at, I'm sorry, Jesus looks at Peter and says, you're going to deny me three times. And the Greek text shows that Peter gets agitated, angry or agitated. And he says, I will die, but I will not deny you. And we all know what happens. We know that indeed Peter denies him, and we're going to cover that in a minute, and all the apostles flee when he gets arrested. So here's what I want us to do. I want us to take the, take the elements. You know what? I, I forgot to get me some element. Would you mind grabbing me some? Because I want to join. We're going to take the elements together. And what I, this is a little different. It's not the normal template for the Lord's Supper or what we call communion. And I realize that. But um, I want you to, to, to join me, if you will, you, you, you don't have to. Thank you very much. I went to all the trouble and then forgot about this. So here's what I'd like you to do. And we're, and we're doing it in the middle of the service. It's, it's not according to how we normally do it, and I realize that. But what I'd like you to do is simply close your eyes with me and envision yourself at this table with Jesus. as we're. T you know, he says, as often as you will, do this in remembrance of me. So what I'm encouraging you to do this morning as you take the, the, the bread and you take the, the juice or the wine, that you have it in your heart. This is my pledge to you, Lord Jesus. I thank you and we're going to take the bread. He's broken it, his, his body broken for us. Take the bread. And as we drink the cup, we think in our minds, Jesus... This is my pledge. I want to live for you. Help me. Because I want to live for you for the rest of my days. So the, the blood shed for you. Take it now. Lord Jesus, we thank you for what we know your intention was. You fully intended to give your life for us. You fully intended to 
submit your body to torment and your blood to be shed and you fully intended to die for us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Verses 32 through 41, chapter 15 still. Jesus goes to Gethsemane, takes Peter, James, and John with him, and he says to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow. And he's asked them to pray with him. And many of us know the story. He finds them sleeping. Verses 43 through 50, an armed group of soldiers from the temple guard so these are Jewish soldiers that guard the temple, for, sent by the Sanhedrin, the ruling party, the ruling committee of Judaism, and they arrest him in the garden, and we all know that story. And then in verse 50, Mark says, then everyone deserted him and fled. They take, it's probably close to midnight at this point. That's what we're guessing. And they take Jesus, according to Matt, I, I know I told you guys I was going to read and teach Mark as if the other Gospels didn't exist, but I had questions about Caiaphas the high priest, and so I did cross-reference, just to make sure I wasn't mistaken. Matthew says they took Jesus to the palace of Caiaphas, okay, and that's important, and you'll see why. So they take Jesus to the, pre, the high priest's residence and put him on trial. They take several testimonies given against Jesus, but they're not consistent, they conflict. And so the high priest decides to question Jesus himself. As I was reading this text, and I know I've shared with you guys multiple times, this is the first time I've ever taught through Mark's Gospel, and so I'm seeing things that I've never seen before. I'm, I'm, I'm making connections I've never made before. I'm asking questions I've never asked before. And I believe it's helped me to, to figure out some things that are happening. And one of them was this. As I'm, as I'm reading the text, I'm thinking, well, I just don't get the high priest and his condemn and why he condemns Jesus. Uh, and we'll get to that in a minute, but, but I, I want to explain to you what happened in my own mind, in my own heart. I'm thinking something's, I'm missing something about this trial in front of Caiaphas. I can't help but think that, you know, that we think this is the first time that Jesus and Caiaphas have ever been face to face. If you think about it, scribes and Pharisees are always coming to test Jesus. Who are, who's sending them? Probably Caiaphas. But he's not going to do it. He's the high priest. And so Jesus and Caiaphas are eyeball to eyeball. Talk about the showdown, you know, that I've been telling you about. This is the showdown. It's not just Jesus with the ruling class. It's Jesus and the high priest. I mean, if you, knowing Jewish history, you know the importance of this, right? I think that Caiaphas sees in Jesus a renegade. Possibly a a dissident, trying to lead a revolt, a revolution against Rome. It was common practice in the Jewish faith to do that, and it was actually something that oftentimes happened around the high holidays. Yom Kippur, the, the New Year, and the Passover being the two big ones. And I'm thinking in my mind, Caiaphas looks at Jesus, and he probably sees him like he saw John the Baptist. He probably thinks Jesus is one of these nut jobs the, the, remember I told you about the priests who, who left the temple because they believed it had been desecrated. They believed that it was distorted and that it was no longer God's house and they moved into the caves around the Dead Sea where we get the Dead Sea Scrolls. And they write writings that talk about they believe God will send a Messiah to overthrow this temple that's not doing the job. And I think Caiaphas sees in Jesus this whole mentality. Well, those questions and those thoughts made me decide that I needed, to look at, I needed to look at some scholarship to make sure I'm not just flying off the handle. Well, I found this woman at the University of Edinburgh, Helen Bond, and she's an expert, lo and behold, in some of the central figures surrounding the life of Jesus. 
So she's done all of her, a lot of her research on Caiaphas, Pontius Pilate, the, the main players in the life of Jesus. So I found a book that she wrote several years ago on Caiaphas, the high priest. Very interesting book. So if, if you're interested, Helen Bond, professor at the University of Edinburgh. Let me tell you some of the things that I'd never heard before that I want to share with you. Remember, I've told you numerous times, I want you to hear things that you've never heard before because I'm sitting here hearing things I've never heard before and I don't think that's right. I want you to know like I want to know so I can better understand what's going on. Caiaphas was not elected according to the Old Testament law to be high priest. You know, there's a way that there's a procedure that they would use to select the high priest. He was appointed by the governor of Rome, the, the governor of Judea, a Roman governor. He was appointed to be high priest in the year 18. So when Jesus is standing in front of Caiaphas, it's been 13 years that he has been the high priest. He ended up serving, I think, for 18 years. Caiaphas came from a wealthy family that had political ties to the Romans. They've excavated what they believe, most scholars believe, to be the palace of Caiaphas, mentioned in Matthew. Hunter, if we can get that slide. This is a scholar's rendition based on the excavation of the foundations. Now, admittedly, this is a drawing. This is a rendition, but it's... It's using the foundations discovered in the archaeological dig and it's using buildings that we know about and had sketches of or something. They, I mean, they don't just make this up. And this is a rendition of one of the leading scholars from the archaeological dig of, of the size and scope of the palace of Caiaphas. What's my point? Caiaphas is from a wealthy family and he lives in the lap of luxury. The next slide, Hunter, if you don't mind. This is the actual entryway. I mean, this is the uncovered entryway of this palace in Jerusalem that verifies the scope, the magnificence of the palace that Caiaphas lived in. In addition, they have dug and, and discovered that there are multiple houses around Caiaphas that were occupied by the high-ranking priests around him and they're also mansions. They're living in luxury. And we know they're Jewish residents. They're built in... Now this is an interesting twist. All these buildings are built with Hellenistic style. Remember Hellenism? It's the Greek orientation that the Jews hated. All these priests are living in Hellenized homes. But they're, but they're following the law of Moses. So they don't have the normal Greek or Roman accoutrements like mosaics of people or animals because that's against the mosaic law and so these priests are living under the law but they're living lavish wealthy lives so it makes more sense now to me when I hear Jesus say to the scribes and Pharisees you're whitewashed tombs you live in houses that are all beautiful on the outside but in the inside they're filled with dead men's bones the four high priests prior to Caiaphas had only served an average of one year apiece. In the Second Temple, Jeru in the Second Temple Israel, the average rule of a high priest was three to four years, and then they would bring in a new man. They don't want someone to be in there. But here we have Caiaphas; he's already served for thirteen years. There are one hundred and fifty. Mikvahs. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. I've never heard of this. Next slide, Hunter. <clears throat> a mikvah is a ritual bath built around the temple area because the, the Jewish leadership demanded that before any of these resident, any of these Jews from all over the Roman world or even living in Jerusalem who come to offer sacrifice. They must be ritually clean before they even go in and buy a sacrifice. They have uncovered 150 of these bathing pools around the temple area. And they have discovered evidence that they're owned, these baths are owned by who? The priests. And what do they do? What do they demand from the people to bathe in them? More money. 
They have to pay to bathe in them. So it all started making sense to me. Jesus is thinking in his mind, these people trek for hundreds of, you know, a couple hundred miles maybe from Egypt to try to live under the law and to please God. They have to spend a lot of money to get to Jerusalem. They have to spend money to live, to stay in Jerusalem for about a week to go through all the festivals. They have to pay money to get bathed ritually. Then they have to go in the temple and pay more money to, to, to buy shekels because you can't buy a, a sacrificial animal with a Roman coin because that would be sacrilegious. So they have to exchange their Roman coins for shekels. And what happens? The money changers charge you for that. And then they finally get to go and buy their animals and we think that a lot of them were taking advantage of people. Jews who lived in the Greco-Roman world, they don't know what a shekel's worth. Oh, that pigeon, it'll be five shekels. Five shekels when it's really only two. And this is what's happening, I think. Jesus is fed up with it. God is fed up with it. And it's the showdown because God has decided, you know what? This temple is not working. The law of Moses is not working. It's become corrupt. And I think Jesus is in agreement with the Qumran ex-priests. The temple has become bogus. There's too much politics involved. There's too much money involved for Jesus. Think about Jesus. He lives, he sleeps under the stars. I mean, he's not, he doesn't go around making money. He's living kind of like a, a vagabond preacher. Meanwhile, Caiaphas and all of his buddies are living in these palaces and don't want to be around sinners. Remember every time Jesus is in a, a place where even the woman who anoints him, people are offended because Jesus allowed this sinner to touch him. And that's in Jesus' mind. Man, we got way too many politics involved. We got way too much money involved. And we got way too much hand-holding with Rome involved. So I'm done with this. So yeah, I'm going to Jerusalem. And we're going to throw down. And we're going to have the showdown of the OK Corral. And the disciples are like, let's do this. The only difference is Jesus has no intention of killing anybody. He has no intention of overthrowing the Romans. He has come to do what? To lay down his life and die. I don't think Caiaphas condemns Jesus due to blasphemy. That's happened multiple times and they didn't try the person. They let, him, they let their little movement Flail, flail along in the desert knowing that if it got too big the Romans are going to come kill them all. So something's going on here and I think this could be it. Caiaphas is afraid that Jesus is here to start a revolution. And he's worried that if that happens the Romans are going to come and interrupt his little party. Now that's just, this is my opinion. I'm, I've read similar things in other scholars but that's my opinion. So he's in front of Caiaphas, verse 61. Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus says, I am. Now that alone could get him in trouble for saying, I am. But then he says, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One coming on the clouds of glory. And it's at that point that Caiaphas rips his cloak. Jesus is now saying, I am the Son of Man out of Daniel. And he's coming on the clouds and you will. Jesus says, you will see that. Because he's not about to see it. Jesus is about to die and he knows it. He hands him over to the guards. They beat him. They mock him. The temple guards, not Romans yet. And then verses 66 through 72, Peter denies that he knows Jesus. He denies him three times. Chapter 15, early in the morning. Early in the morning, probably 6 o'clock in the morning, they bind Jesus like a common criminal and take him to Pilate, the governor of Judea. The Jews are not supposed to issue the death penalty to a fellow Jew, especially during a high holiday, so they want the Romans to do it. So when he stands in front of Pontius Pilate, what does Pilate ask him? Does anybody remember? Does Pilate say, do you claim to be Messiah? No. What does he say? Why, why, why is everybody upset with you? Yeah. Why is everybody mad with you? And he says, some tell me that you're the king of the Jews. Where did that come from, you guys? 
I think Caiaphas went to Pontius Pilate or somebody in his little crowd and said, this guy claims to be the king of the Jews. Because he wants Pilate to think he's a seditious man about to start a riot. So Pilate doesn't ask him, are you Messiah? Pilate doesn't care. But he says, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus won't answer him directly. He, you know, Jesus remains silent. Pilate doesn't want to convict him. He doesn't see why the Jews have brought him. So he trades, he gets the crowd, and he uses a kind of an obscure Roman law, and he trades Barabbas, a convicted criminal, and condemns Jesus trying to please the crowds. He's trying to please the crowds because the scribes and Pharisees went in among the crowds and jacked him up. You know, call out for Barabbas. Tell him you want Jesus crucified. Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea, doesn't live in Jerusalem. He doesn't even live in Judea. He lives in a palace in Caesarea on the coast of Samaria. He only comes to Jerusalem on high holidays. And guess what he brings when he comes? A legion of soldiers. Four to 5,000 Roman soldiers show up anytime Pontius Pilate shows up in Jerusalem. Why? Because he's afraid someone might try to kill him, and he's afraid they might riot, especially during a high holiday. Just that alone angers the, the zealot Jews. They don't want Roman soldiers in their holy city on a holy holiday. So if you think about all of this, it adds to the, the, the drama of what happens. So he hands verses 16 through 20. Pontius Pilate hands Jesus over to the Roman soldiers. They beat him. They flog him with a whip, a Roman whip that rips the flesh out. And the Roman soldiers know good and well this is all in preparation to crucify him, which is what the Romans did to criminals, to murderers and others who commit heinous acts. Nine o'clock in the morning, they crucified Jesus with two criminals, one on each side. Nine o'clock in the morning, okay? Three hours later at noon, there's an eclipse of the sun, and that brings to my mind what Jesus said in the apocalyptic discourse that he gives on the Mount of Olives that we talked about last Sunday, where Jesus, going through, the disciples asked him, when is all this going to happen? And one of the things Jesus says that sounds like it's going to be in the future the sun and the moon will be darkened. Well, guess what? An, an eclipse occurs at noon. And, you know, anybody who's, I mean, we've probably all seen an eclipse. It's really eerie. You know, when it's fully ecliptic, the, the light's odd. Do you, you know what I'm talking about? It's just a strange light. That all adds to the mystique that the Messiah is being executed. At 3 p.m., after six hours of hanging on the cross, after enduring brutality at the hands of the Roman soldiers, Jesus cries out in agony, quoting Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Verse 37, Jesus dies. Verse 40, Mark names three women who were there at the cross and witnessed his death. He names Three women, and then he says, Mark says, many other women who had come up with Jesus to Jerusalem were also there. That makes many things go through my mind. All the disciples said, we're not going to betray you. When Jesus said, you're all going to flee, they said, no, no, no. And they all did. But the women were there to watch him die. Reminds me of the opening of this discourse of Mark where a woman anoints Jesus for burial and the men are complaining. And then when Jesus dies, where are the apostles? They're all gone. And the women are there. Now some of that is cultural. The men don't want to be around a dead body which will make them unclean. So they leave it to the women. Historically, women have been important in the Christian church and it's because the foundation is laid right at the death of Jesus. The women are there. And we're going to see next week on Easter Sunday, who are the first people to see Jesus? Who are the first Christians to see Jesus? Women. Women. I just think it's an interesting twist of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus that women are given a prominent role in His resurrection. And that extends in the early Christian church.
The women are the ones who undergird the church in prayer. It's always been that way. Verse 42, it's closing in on 6 o'clock p.m. Jesus has died, but it's getting close to 6 o'clock, and that's when the Sabbath begins. They need to get this dead body taken care of. They don't want it to affect their ability to, to worship on the Sabbath. Joseph Arimathea, one of the members of the Sanhedrin, offers a tomb so that they can take the body and put it in a cool place to keep it from deteriorating any faster than, than it needs to because they're going to skip a day before they can do anything. And, they, and the women, they wrap him in a shroud. Why? To keep insects off his body. Now, you know, you think about it, he's been bleeding, his skin's all wrecked, so that's not going to be pretty. But they put him in this tomb to keep wild animals and insects and deterioration from his body. And the women want to anoint him and put stuff on him for burial. And so the women see where he's laid. They know the tomb so that they can go back there on Sunday morning. And so this morning, we're leaving Jesus dead and in the tomb. I've heard many Protestants complain about Catholics and they don't like the crucifix. Oh, they leave Jesus hanging on the cross. And I understand that criticism. But historically, the Christian church, and I mean from way back, before the Roman Catholic Church, went through the Passion Week because they want us, and I think the text wants us, to fully embrace what Jesus went through. Because He did it for us. It's not a ritual. He gave Himself to be bloodied and tortured for you and me. We sing about it every Sunday, don't we? Almost every Sunday, we reference the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This morning, I'm wearing basically black because in the more liturgical churches, they will, sell a, they will do this message on Fridays oftentimes and they will call it, we call it Good Friday because the sacrifice was good. But in liturgical churches, they'll oftentimes refer to it as Black Friday. And you'll come in and everyone wears black. The priest has no color vestments. There's no flowers on the stage or on the, around the pulpit. And, when, and, you, and you preach the death of Jesus. And when you're done, everyone is supposed to exit the building without saying a word to anybody. And you're not supposed to look anybody in the eye. And the, the ritual of that is that the church wants us to fully embrace that we are culpable. You know, we sing songs, I paid a debt, or I mean, he paid a debt I could not pay. I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid the debt, I can't remember how the song goes now, but, and we, we sing the song, um, when I owed this debt, you gave it all for me. And that's the whole idea of reading the text. And I'll, in all honesty, I normally don't do this, but for me, when I'm making my trek up to Easter in this church, and, I'm, and I know I'm speaking, I spend a lot of time thinking about the death of Jesus, and I had to to do this message. And it had an impact on me. And it's supposed to have an impact on us. Now, do we leave? So this, this morning, we're going to leave here in a minute, and Jesus is dead. He's in the tomb. It's now we know the next we know, you know, seems like there's a song that talks about, you know, Friday's here but Sunday's coming. We all know Easter's coming. We all know the tomb is going to be empty on Sunday morning. But I think it's a positive thing if you if you think in your mind we took communion as a pledge. Jesus, I'm pledging to you. I'm not going to deny you. I, I'd never noticed, I'd never paid attention that the Last Supper was about Jesus saying, one of you is going to betray me. I'd never, I'd never put much emphasis on that until this week. So when we took those elements, we were saying, Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. In fact, if you'll help me, I'm going to live for you. I pledge to you that I'm going to live for you. And that's what we should be doing. Every day we should be doing that. We fail at places, 
And we, what we need to do is ask God to help us. God, with all my might, I want to serve you. If you'll help me, if you'll give me strength, if you'll give me grace, I will serve you. So this morning, we're going to leave, and we're going to leave Jesus in the tomb. And I know that doesn't, that alone doesn't make us feel happy. We know the story. Next Sunday will be celebration of his resurrection. I'm asking you, like we did in communion, to embrace that he did this for us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You paid a debt you didn't owe, and I owed a debt that I could never pay. And you did it for me, you did it for each one of us, you did it for the entire world. And you did it willingly, you laid your life down. Greater man, no greater love exists that, that a, but that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Thank you, Jesus, for that. God, I pray that you will help us to live a life of allegiance to you. And we look forward to open celebration of your resurrection. We celebrate it today. But next Sunday we'll focus on it. And we thank you because we know the story doesn't end with you in the tomb. Thank you. Help each of us here to embrace you to commit to you and to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would anyone like to make comment? No? We have, we have a small crowd today. Yes? Um, thank you so much for sharing the story. And I really like um, the part you um, introduced about the uh, how Sasha lays and you show the photos of it in Jerusalem. Mm. This is the first time that I see it. Yes, well, thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. All right. Thank you for joining us. Have a good day. Your hand goes. <laughs> Does anyone, anybody want to share anything? You know, we're not. Ten? No? Oh. Apologize for all the technical issues. I'm glad that you could join. Now I'm going to watch the replay ahead of it. Still having technical issues, apparently. <laughs> um, does anybody want to make comment? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want us to, to miss the opportunity. I have a comment. Yes, Tony. Yeah. This is a story of the part that I have never think about, thought about before. This is very new to me. Mm. It's like I have read several times from Matthew, Mark, and the look about mm. the crucifixion of Jesus. This is the very first time I heard <clears throat> the very uh, you know, general as well as specific story in, deep, in depth about uh, Jesus' death and this uh, is the crucifixion. So this is very new to me. Mm. In my mind. Well, I mean, I've read it for 42 years and missed a lot. It's hard to understand it all. It's hard. It's, I mean, the basic story is easy, right? Yeah. He died. He died for us. His his death opens the door for us to know God and to to be in relationship with Him. That's the basic story. The details, in a way, the details that I shared, in a way, don't really matter. Um, but for me, it made a lot of sense when I started reading about Caiaphas that he lived in, that he lived as a wealthy man. I mean, it made so many things that Jesus said become more real to me. When remember, Jesus tells the rich young ruler, you know, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and then the disciples. And then Jesus turns to the disciples and says, it's easier for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. What if he was thinking about the high priests and their, you know, he knows what they're doing. It just, 
And it makes the cleansing of the temple so much more real to me of why he's angry. The poor common person has to spend a lot of money to worship God in that context. And that's just not right. It's not right. You know? We shouldn't have to... Hey, can you turn that off before I... Actually, I was loving it. I left it all on purpose. 